A big league manager turns his back on God. I'm not going to be a family guy or a Christian because that's not what big leaguers do. Until tragedy strikes. You go, Dad, I got something I got to tell you. I have a brain tumor. I'm sorry. Find out what happens when the chicken runs at midnight. Plus, best-selling pastor and author Robert Jeffress on how to live a life of success, significance, and satisfaction on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. The Milwaukee Brewers just fell just a little bit short of a World Series appearance this season. But one Brewers fan is smiling today thanks to a good Samaritan and a Brewers game last spring. 43-year-old Lenny was in desperate need of a kidney transplant. Last April, he wore this shirt to a Milwaukee game, and the picture went viral. A teacher from Wisconsin and fellow Brewers fan named Emily, you see her there on the left, saw the post and contacted Lenny's family. After being tested, Emily realized she wasn't a match. However, through the National Kidney Registry, she entered Lenny and herself as prospective donor and recipient in what's called a kidney chain. And because of that, Lenny quickly found a match and had a successful kidney transplant this past Friday. Before the surgery, Lenny said, the gift Emily is giving to our family is big enough, but to also show the next generation what one person can do is absolutely priceless. Emily, you are truly one of a kind and we're all honored to know you. Well, the kidney chain means that Emily also donated a kidney last week. She is now out of bed and even visited Lenny after his surgery. And go, Emily. What a wonderful thing yes. to do, to say, yes, I'm going to donate part of my body so that somebody else can live. Uh, the Bible would say, no greater love yes. has anyone than this. Very, very good deed indeed. <laughs> well, from Wisconsin to Nebraska, where dash cam footage captures Deputy Jason Jones doing something unusual. He is installing car seats. His colleague, Deputy Jessica Manning, pulled the vehicle over for speeding and noticed that the two children in the back seat weren't properly secured. Well, that's when Deputy Manning called for backup while she went to Walmart to purchase the car seats. Walmart plans on reimbursing, reimbursing Deputy Manning for her good deed. She doesn't see it that way. Manning says she was just doing her job. I just didn't see any other viable option. I was, that just was the only choice and um, it's something I would gladly do to keep some kids safe. Well, the family wasn't ticketed for speeding. However, they did receive a ticket for not having their children in car seats. It is important. Yes, and families should always have their kids in car seats. Yeah. That but hats off. I mean, talk about going the extra mile. Yeah, could you stay here and watch the kids? I'm going to yeah. Walmart for a minute. Uh, the motto is protect and serve, yes. and it's definitely yeah. a protect on that one. Well, to Russia now, where one church is hoping to increase attendance, uh, get this, by trying something a little exotic. Well, exotic animals, that is. The small church near St. Petersburg has added wildlife viewing in the basement, including three Nile crocodiles. The crocs are the biggest attraction, but visitors can also see turtles, iguanas, and birds. The priest believes that local adults and particularly children will be interested in the new zoo and hopefully begin attending church. <laughs> that's a, that's well, a unique. Uh, who says the Russian Orthodox Church is old school? <laughs> uh, they're <laughs> trying to do something very unique. I'm not sure going to see reptiles get you in a spiritual mood, but anyway. I, I don't know. The results <laughs> remain to be seen, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you posted. Well, up next, living life with genuine purpose, how you can learn from the life of Elijah. Pastor and author Robert Jeffress joins us to tell us how right after this. Well, so many of us long to break out of the mundane and discover a greater purpose in our lives. Our next guest has a message for those who are wanting more. Dr. Robert Jeffers is the pastor of a 13,000 member church in Dallas, Texas. Well, you might remember him when he prayed for President Trump in the Oval Office. Dr. Jeffers says we miss out when we give up on our prayer life. In his book, Choosing the Extraordinary Life, Dr. Jeffers shares secrets on the power of persistent prayer and how we can experience dramatic answers when facing impossible situations. Dr. Jeffers joins us now. Welcome. It's good to have you on the Interactive Show. Thank you, Terry. Choosing the extraordinary life and the person that you look at biblically as you define the potential for all of us to have an extraordinary life is Elijah. Why Elijah? 
Well, for two reasons, Terry. First of all, the Bible says Elijah was no spiritual super person. Yeah. He was an ordinary person like you and like me. He had doubts, discouragements, times of disobedience, and yet God used this ordinary person in an extraordinary way. And the subtitle of the book is Seven Secrets for Success and Significance. And I talk about those secrets that Elijah's life uh, manifests. <coughs> but the second reason I chose him was because Elijah lived in a time like we live in. You know, we say sometimes, oh, things are so evil, so ungodly. Yes. How can you really have an extraordinary life? Well, if you think today is ungodly, just look back at 9th century BC Israel when idolatry and child sacrifice were prevalent. So this book is written to say, you don't have to settle for the mundane. Yeah. You can have a truly extraordinary life. There is hope for every <laughs> yes. single one of us. That's right. You know, most of us, when we think of Elijah, think of the showdown at Mar Mount Carmel. And what do we learn from that? Because I mean, he really, that was where the rubber met the road. He really laid it all down there. Well, one, one of the secrets for an extraordinary life he illustrates is unleashing the power of prayer. Remember James said in James 5, the effective prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. And in the next verse, James uses Elijah as an example of that person. And you know, it was interesting when Elijah prayed that 62 word prayer, the fire of God fell down from heaven. And I talk about in the book three principles we can learn from Elijah about praying powerfully. First of all, pray honestly. Don't pray what you think should be in your heart. Pray what's actually in your heart. God knows us, it anyway. Do most of us do that? <laughs> no, we don't. We think we can keep things from God or we're, we're, we're fearful of really telling. Right. <laughs> so pray, pray honestly. Secondly, pray boldly. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us have a case of blessitis in our prayer life. Bless this, bless this. Yeah. We don't want to ask God for really specific things. Mm -hmm. But uh, Elijah teaches us that uh, to pray, see God do big things, pray for God to be, do big things. And then finally, pray persistently. Later on in 1 Kings 18, Elijah later on prayed for rain. He had to pray seven times before the rain came. And I've often thought, Terry, what if he had given up the third time yes. or the fourth time, fourth time? Don't pray when the answer seems easy. Pray when it seems impossible. And Don't give on. up praying. Yeah, keep on keep praying on. until God answers one way or the other. There is power in prayer. I mean, obviously we see that in Elijah's life, but I think a lot of us go through life hoping instead of praying. But, but praying is the key, isn't it, to opening the door? It is, because James said, you have not because you ask, ask not. not. And look, yeah. there's no name it and claim it promise. I mean, before you claim it, be sure God has named it. <laughs> but there are some things God has named, and we don't appropriate them because we don't have the faith to ask for them. Well, talk about prayer in your own family's <laughs> life, because you have some examples that you share in the book that are... Well, that's right. I mean, I think about praying big things. My daughter... Daughter, Julia and her husband Ryan they had three miscarriages over a period of several years and uh, they started to pray for something big they prayed that God would send them triplets one life to replace every life that was lost and uh, I remember thinking Julia don't do that let's we, make it hard for God <laughs> yeah. well, we don't have triplets in our family and you're gonna be yes. disappointed in God now that's how much of a man of faith I am <laughs> and Julia was the one who said to me dad if you want to see God do big things you have to pray wow. big things. Last December, they gave birth to triplets. They've been on your show here before. You're an amazing answer to the power Boy. of prayer. When we pray specifically like Julia and it's Ryan, right? Yes. Julia and Ryan did. God seems to honor that. It's like he enters into the process because he's put the he's put the dream in our hearts to begin with, right? That's right. And again, you look at Elijah. He prayed for the fire to come. It did. He prayed for it to rain. It did. He prayed for a widow's son to be raised from the de dead, and that actually happened. And again, 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. All of those requests are within the boundary of God's will. And, you know, as I look back, Terry, in my prayer journal, I'm grateful for powerfully answered prayers. Amen. But I can honestly say I'm just as grateful for the things God said no to. Oh, how many times have I, I thanked Oh, him? I mean, I think what could have happened, <laughs> yeah. it would have been a disaster. Yes. So yes. to me, faith in prayer is boldly asking, but then quietly trusting in yes. God's will. You know, um, we... 
not only was Elijah amazing in his courage and his boldness and his prayer, he was very much like I said, that he too got discouraged. He too came to a place of yeah. just kind of curling up in a ball and saying, I, I, I can't do this or be this anymore. Right. He, I mean, he went from the mountaintop at yeah. Mount Carmel to the Valley of Despair. He said, Lord, take my life. And one of the secrets I talk about in choosing the extraordinary life is learning how to handle bad days. Yes. Not how to avoid bad days. We can't do that. But by, by bad days, I'm not just talking about 24-hour periods. I'm talking about seasons of life yes. in which discouragement upon discouragement piles up. And Elijah illustrates how to handle that. You know, we have to take care of ourselves physically. Elijah did that. You know, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Yes. <laughs> and Elijah slept. I'm and you have to use let your, <laughs> your <laughs> not right now, hopefully, yeah, okay. but eventually okay. <laughs> we'll use that. He took care of himself spiritually, but he also took care of himself emotionally. You know, Elijah mm -hmm. left the cave. Finally, God said, leave that cave and yes. go reconnect. You know, my friend David Jeremiah says the only person who thinks you ought to take time off from church when you're going through a bad time is the devil. Yeah. He wants to isolate you and then destroy you. Yeah. There's so much that's rich in this book, and I just want to recommend to all of you picking up a copy of Choosing the Extraordinary Life, God's Seven Secrets to Success and Significance. It's for all of us, and it's available wherever books are sold. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Terry. Profound word. Gordon? Well, up next, an odd phrase that means everything to this former big league coach. He says, Dad, when you're coaching third and you reach down and cup your hands, what are you telling those guys on a second? The chicken runs at midnight or what? Find out what it means right after this. Rich Donnelly spent 37 years of his life trying to make it to the big leagues. In 1980, he made it as a coach of the Texas Rangers. Rich would do anything to stay there, including betraying the ones he loved the most. Some say that time waits for no man. And for Rich Donnelly, a 28-year-old veteran coach in Major League Baseball, he didn't find out how precious time was until it ran out. He was a husband and father of four children, Bubba, Amy, Mike, and Tim. When he wasn't on the field, he was home spending time with his kids, especially his boys. But when it came to his only daughter, Amy, she had to compete for his attention. I was prejudiced to the boys. My kids were going to grow up and be players, basketball, whatever. Amy, she was my daughter, maybe a cheerleader, maybe something, nothing sports. Sports wasn't big back then. So, I spent most of my time with my boys. If they asked me, Dad, come out and let's hit, I'd go out with them. If Amy would ask me, I'll be out later and I'd watch the game. Never go out. And never knew how much that meant to her until later. Amy so desperately wanted her father's attention that one day she wrote him a note. And she said, Dear Dad, did you think you were going to have four boys? She, she says, no, us girls rock too. But Rich was too busy to notice. As his kids got older, baseball became all he cared about. And he slowly began to drift away from his family. He even abandoned his faith in God. I don't need you no more. I got to where I wanted to be. I uh, got everything I want. I got to the big leagues. I was ashamed because I thought if they saw me going to church, I would be, that was not tough. That was not big league. That was not, you're, you're one of them. They were tough. They drank. They ran around, women. That's what all big leaguers did. With his moral compass on the shelf, Rich began having an affair with another woman. I disregarded my family at that point. I didn't care. It's, it's like I didn't care if they found out or not. I'm, I'm in the big leagues. Hey, it took me 37 years to get here. This is my dream. I'm not going to do anything to hurt it. I'm, I'm not going to be a family guy or a Christian because that's not what big leaguers do. But his wife did find out and divorced him. None of his kids were more hurt and disappointed than 14-year-old Amy. Wow. 
my baby. She didn't want nothing to do with you. And we didn't talk for a long time. In 1986, Rich joined the Pittsburgh Pirates coaching staff. Not having his family around made him regret the choices he'd made. He began asking God for forgiveness. I said, Lord, I've failed you miserably. I know you always say you, you will forgive me, but man, if you'll forgive me for this, you are something else. I, I really, I, I couldn't have screwed this up any, anymore. As time went on, Rich slowly began to repair his relationship with Amy. Then in 1992, Rich got a call from her he wasn't ready for. Hey, Dad, Ames. Hey, what's up? What are you doing, Ames? He goes, Dad, I got something I got to tell you. She said, please don't be mad. I have a brain tumor, and I'm sorry. I couldn't even talk. Amy had surgery. Afterwards, the doctor came out with the results. He says, Rich, your daughter has a malignant brain tumor right behind her eye, and we can't get it out. I couldn't take it. I walked out. I said, yeah, you're a big, tough guy. You did all that junk. You did all this. This is your fault. You cheated on your wife. You cheated on your kids. You did this. You did this to this. This is your fault. Amy endured six months of chemo. On one of her off days, she, along with her best friend Cindy, were allowed to watch her father coach during Game 5 of the NLCS against the Atlanta Braves, which the Pirates won, forcing a Game 6 in Atlanta. And I told her, if we get in this World Series, you're coming. We're going back to the hotel, she reaches up, puts her arms around my neck. And she was my girl again. Then, something interesting happened when Amy jokingly asked him a question. And she says, Dad, when you're coaching third, and you reach down and cup your hands, what are you telling those guys on a second? The chicken runs at midnight or what? And I went, what, what you, where'd you come up with that one at? He said, it just came out. The chicken runs at midnight. The phrase didn't make any sense at the time, but would later mean more than they realized. The Pirates won game six in Atlanta, which forced a game seven. Amy couldn't reach her dad to wish him good luck for the game. So she asked the team receptionist to give him a message. The dear dad, ticker runs at midnight, love Amy. And I'm going, man, oh man, we're, we're gonna win this thing and Amy's going to the World Series with, and she's home with her pom-poms and everything. And when they announced the starting lineups, the big boom microphone was on. And Chico Lynn, I had, he saw the note. He goes, hey man, what's this? I go, ticker runs at midnight. He goes, okay, good, ticker runs at midnight. He had no idea what it was, none. So he's yelling it to the players. You could hear it on national TV. She heard it in Texas. She heard it. Her and Cindy, they went crazy. We're going to win. We're going, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, the Pirates lost. The family spent the next few months with Amy as she fought for her life. Then in January, Amy lapsed into a coma, and Rich was instructed to say his last goodbye. I just told her, Amy, I know you can hear me. He said, I'm so sorry for everything I've done. Love you to death. And it's just surreal that you have to say goodbye, knowing when you walk out of that room, that's the last time you'll see her. Amy died on January 28, 1993, at the age of 17. There was only one inscription the family felt was suitable for her tombstone. We go to the funeral home, and they have all these beautiful sayings, all oh, the Lord be with you, and all this. And we go, no. chicken runs at midnight. So they put chicken runs at midnight. And it became our family motto. In 1997, Rich joined the Florida Marlins coaching staff. And that season, the unbelievable happened. Now, magically, we get in a World Series. So we had a second baseman named Craig Counts. When Counts hit, he held his hand up like he had and he flapped like a chicken. So my two boys, Tim and Mike, were bat boys all summer. 
they'd call him chicken. They'd say, hey, the chicken wants to take some batting practice. Hey, the chicken wants some ground balls. The chicken, no, didn't think nothing of it. During the 11th inning of game seven of the 1997 World Series against the Cleveland Indians, Craig Council's nickname would come to mean everything to the Donleys. Council's on third base with two outs. Edgar Renteria gets a base hit, bringing Council in for the winning run. The Florida Marlins win the World Series. Rich had achieved his dream. But what happened next shook him to his core. Now, people are on the field. Pandemonium. I'm trying to find my sons, Tim and Mike. They were the bat pole. I can't find them. I see Tim halfway between first and second. I see him screaming, crying, red face, tears. What's the matter with you? What are you crying about? He said, Dad, look. I said, what are you talking about? He said, look at the clock. The stadium clock was behind us. I looked, it was 12.03. He said, Dad, the chicken ran at midnight. All the celebration stopped. I felt like, again, all the blood drained right out of me. I was just like this. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> this can't happen. Amy said the chicken ran at midnight. The chicken ran at midnight. Amy's prophetic phrase had come full circle. And in that moment, so did Rich's redemption. Since that thrilling night, he has spent every moment honoring his faith in Christ and his beloved daughter that changed his heart. In the book entitled, The Chicken Runs at Midnight by Tom Friend, Rich gives great detail about his story and hopes readers get the message that God can change anyone, regardless of the mistakes they've made. Because in the end, his love conquers all. God forgave me doing all that stuff and yet allowed me to reach my dream and allowed me to have peace within myself of, of Amy passing away. He let me have peace. The Lord is like a statue and there's ice all around him. And that ice is all the material things in this world. And you chip it away, chip it away, chip it away, chip it away. And when there's nothing left, the Lord is He's the last thing left. He ain't gonna leave you. And he won't leave you either. His promise is he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And it's a twofold promise. The first one is his physical presence will always be there because in him we live and move and have our being. But have you ever been in a relationship where the other person checks out? Uh, they forsake you. Uh, they, they're, they're there physically, but they're not there. Well, his promise is, I will never forsake you. I will always love you. I will always be there for you. Get these facts straight because they are facts. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Before God laid the foundation of the world, he created good things for you to walk into. Now, for Rich, it was fulfilling a lifelong dream. And that dream, where was that? What's the source of that dream? Well, that dream is from God. He's created good works for you to walk into. Now, he hasn't given up on that dream. These are things that he put into place. He always wants to fulfill them for you. Why? Because he loves you. Now, when you look at Rich's life, was he worth God's love? The answer is yes and no. Based on what he did, how he went away, how he said, I've got enough of God, I don't need any more. He did all of these things to reject God, but here's God, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He didn't forsake Rich, he won't forsake you. Now, why does he do that? because you are worth his love. You're worth what Jesus paid for you because he sees in you a future and a hope, a potential, and he wants to fulfill that. He wants to fulfill it so badly, he died for you. Now, if this is for you, all you have to do 
It's very simple. All you have to do is bow your head, pray a very simple prayer, and the one who has watched over you from the beginning, he'll answer. He'll show up for you. So bow your head with me. Close your eyes. Let's say a very simple prayer together and let God do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus. That's right. Just say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus. I want you in my life. Lord, I'm sorry that I went away. I'm sorry that I said enough of you. And I turn to you and I ask that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me, that you would make me new again. Do this for me, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed, let me know. Give me a call, 1-800-700-7000, and just say, I want Jesus in my life. Here's a word from Psalms. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations.